Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show with accomplished chess players, authors, personalities, and adult improvers where they discuss their lives, their careers, and share tips about how to improve at chess. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. So without further ado, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have an outstanding guest joining us this week. I have been super excited to interview her. I've been working on it for a while. She is a busy and accomplished lady, the winner of three world championships, the 2014 and 16 Women World Blitz Championships, the 2016 World Rapid Championships. She's consistently one of the strongest female players in the world and was the fourth woman in history to cross the 2600 FIDE rating when she did so in 2012. She's been busy as ever lately. She recently made a deep run in the FIDE World Cup. She came in fourth, but just as importantly, this means that she clinched a spot in the 2022 Women's uh, Women's Candidates Tournament. She's also a commentator, a Twitch streamer, and a tournament organizer, as we will discuss. So I could go on and on, but I think it's time to welcome her to the show, uh, Grandmaster Anna Muzichuk. How are you, Anna? Uh, thank you. Hello, Ben. Hello to all our viewers and listeners. I'm I'm doing well. I think it's a great start. And uh, let's start with the interview. I am really excited about it. Thanks for the invitation to this interview. Oh, well, I'm, I think we're, we're probably even more excited, Anna. So thank you. So are you joining us from Ukraine? Uh, yeah, I joined it. Uh, I joined from Ukraine, from my home city, Lviv, in the western part of Ukraine. Excellent. Yeah. And I know you've been super busy commentating in recent weeks. And before that, the FIDE World Cup, which of course is where I'd like to start, if you don't mind, Anna, obviously one of the um, most important tournaments in the world. And I know that you did not win, but you did achieve something very important in that you're able to play in the, the 2002 Women's Candidates, which uh, for listeners who aren't familiar, of course, means that Anna will be competing to play for the World Championship and it's a, a coveted spot. So Anna, how do you reflect on the World Cup? Um, yes, actually, it was like the main goal to qualify for the candidates. I think not of our listeners are familiar with the system we have in the women's chess, but it's also the same system as men have. Uh, so uh, there are eight players who are qualified to the FIDE candidates tournament. And the winner of the candidates tournament will play the match against the reigning world champion. Uh, at the moment, it's Zhu Wenjun from China. So, uh, yeah, it's like um, it was more important to qualify for the candidates rather than even win this World Cup. And I am really glad I managed so. Uh, and I also have to say that uh, the World Cup for women was organized uh, for the first time before we had the same tournament with the same knockout system, but earlier it was the World Championship. So, uh, yeah, new tournament, new format, and uh, I think it was a successful start for me. And Anna, how do you feel about the new format? Are you a fan of it? Uh, I think that the system we have now with um, the same system as men have, uh, I think it's more fair because um, really like the best players qualify to the candidates and the best player then later on fight to um, play the world championship match. Earlier, uh, we had a very complicated system because one year it was a match for the world championship and another year it was a knockout and it was quite confusing so i prefer the system we have now yeah although the knockout might favor your skills you seem to be quite a quite a skilled uh, fast player between your world blitz championship and your world rapid championship it's difficult to say if uh, this format suits me better because it's a very unpredictable format. Uh, first of all, you start with two classical games and only if there is a tie, then uh, the match uh, proceeds to rapid and uh, if there is still a tie, then to the blitz matches. But first of all, you start with classical. So um, there is also quite a high probability that uh, the match will be decided in the classical part. Uh, but it's also, as I have said, uh, it can be quite unpredictable as, uh, well, you may have a bad day, you lose one game and um, you're just out. Yeah. Uh, normally, we don't have so many tournaments with knockout system and we are more used to 
Swiss system or uh, to round robins. And uh, I also think this is like better for uh, for determining the best player because uh, yeah, one day in one day anything can happen. So uh, while in round robin or in Swiss, let's say you have one bad day, you lose a game, but then you still have more rounds and uh, you can still win the tournament after that. Yeah, totally understandable. As a chess fan, I've often said on the show, I love watching the FIDE knockout tournament, but I've interviewed enough participants like yourself where I know that it's it's uh, it's very unforgiving if you lose, as you say. And organizationally, I know the logistics can be a nightmare. So it's it's tricky because it feels kind of selfish that I enjoy it so much because it seems like it's it's basically, I mean, I don't know. Would you go so far as to say that it's like torture for the players? I mean, it seems super stressful. Uh, I wouldn't say that uh, this is much, much more stressful, but yeah, it's the most stressful tournament, I would say, as uh, yeah, every game, uh, there is uh, the stakes are so high for every single game that uh, each day you come and uh, you have much more pressure than usually. Uh, but also, it's a very long tournament. For example, if you reach the final stage, uh, it means that uh, you have to be uh, at the tournament for more than three weeks. And that's a lot. It's like yeah. every day, three weeks, and so much of stress. Um, usually, our tournaments, uh, classical tournaments, last uh, two weeks, and uh, well, two uh, between two and three, there is quite a big difference. Now, when you talk about the length of the tournament, Anna, are you speaking mainly from like sort of a lifestyle perspective, like it gets old being in the hotel room and somewhat repetitive, or is it just sort of like the the return on invested time? I mean, obviously, I know that. If you don't go far in the World Cup, uh, financially, it's not the best uh, decision for a professional like yourself. But as you go farther, the prize money gets decent. So I was just curious, like, what is it about the length of it that makes that less appealing? Um, yeah, I mean, we can uh, talk a lot about that. And uh, <laughs> uh, people may also check the prizes and they will realize, yeah, of course, if you lose earlier, you don't get much. And moreover, please pay attention to the thing that um, during the World Cup, the players are uh, obliged to pay for themselves. Like there are travel expenses, so there are hotel costs, meals, uh, the payment for the coaches, and so on and so on. In the most of the top level events in which I play, like, I mean, other uh, top level events, for example, Grand Prix tournaments. Um, uh, and others, uh, we have our travel expenses and uh, hotel covered. So this is also additional point um, that is not, uh, let's say, <laughs> which chess players would like to change. Yeah, uh, but on the other hand, um, it gives the opportunity for more players to join the field and to compete for um, qualifying to the candidates, and then. Uh, so on for the world uh, crown. Uh, so of course it has uh, its advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, that makes sense. And obviously there's also sort of a, um, there's pros and cons of the fact that qualifying for the candidates is more democratized. I mean, someone like yourself, if they just ran it down the rating list, you would be in to begin with. Um, but on the other hand, up and coming players, I'm sure, which you once were, um, appreciate the opportunity to, to qualify. Do you do you have a general stance, Anna, on um, how democratic the candidates uh, cycle should be as opposed to just letting in the best players? Uh, you know, it's a very difficult question and uh, every chess player uh, has its own opinion and mainly it's... Uh, Okay, not mainly, but very often it's based on our own priorities and how we wish to see it. Right. Uh, so um, I think um, I shouldn't be the one who should uh, speak about how it should be, but I think it's good that in the last years, uh, FIDA, World Chess Federation, uh, they are asking uh, many players about their thoughts and uh, on different topics, not only about how the system should be, but also, for example, about time controls and uh, in general about different formats. So with this, uh, they can um, get information like what the majority thinks. And I think it's good, it's important, and that's how it should be done. Yeah, that, that makes sense. It's good to be open-minded. And they do, I mean, 
obviously FIDE is not a perfect organization, but they do seem to to pull the players about stuff like that and be certainly willing to to change. Um, so Anna, obviously the results are the results and that's how you get judged and getting in the candidates is the, the most important thing. But uh, how do you feel about the quality of your your play generally at the FIDE World Cup? First of all, I have to say that this was my first tournament after a long break due to the pandemic. Uh, before that, uh, my previous tournament was um, 14 months ago, and that's quite a huge gap, I would say. I think my longest break was six months, uh, but here with 14, it's of course a diff- even a, a more different story, and it's, uh, it makes even a bigger difference. Uh, though I would like to say that, um, uh, well, I'm sorry, actually before I played the Grand Prix, so before Grand Prix in uh, in March and uh, before my first tournament, it was for 14 months, but then from March till uh, June, yeah, there was only three months. So it was actually very important that I had uh, I had a chance to play in the Grand Prix uh, because um, though chess players... Um, had the opportunity to train yeah during the pandemic i mean compared to some other sports when uh, the stadiums or swimming pools were just closed and they didn't have a chance to train uh, we chess players had this op- opportunity but when you don't have practice and when you don't have a clear plan and a clear schedule of tournaments and trainings of course it's also much more difficult and uh, it's not the same it, there is quite a big difference uh, so speaking about uh, my performance at the World Cup, I think it uh, it was pretty good. Uh, of course, um, with this format, sometimes uh, you have to be lucky. And I think uh, speaking even about my very first game against uh, Tatar Abrahamian, I think I was pricing for most of the game, but then there was a point when I was losing. And uh, my opponent missed it, and uh, then I won the game and I won the match. But it's just, you know, an addition to um, to what I have said before, that uh, just imagine I lost that game and maybe I would be out already after the first round. Right. Uh, so, uh, but after that, I think um, the games I played and the way I play them, I'm quite satisfied with my performance. That's good. And, and you mentioned... Um, your training, of course, during quarantine in particular. So I am curious on what what you were able to do. You can't play uh, OTB games, which obviously is a good good chunk of any learning cycle, as you mentioned. But were you able to put in extra work in terms of like either opening prep or or uh, you know tactical work or whatever it may be? Uh, yes, of course, I kept on working, and I have always been um, mainly focused on chess. Uh, so I uh, kept on working on the openings, on the tactics, on uh, middle games, end games, like everything a bit. Uh, but also, as um, there were no tournaments, I tried some new things as uh, streaming, as uh, coaching <laughs> and commentating. So. Um, it was not uh, the worst period uh, because I know many people suffered from the pandemic and many people suffered a lot. Uh, well, for me, it uh, it was quite quite an interesting period. Yeah, well, your your English is amazing and you're a natural as a streamer and commentator, as I'd like to discuss more later. But Anna, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the training. I mean, a player of your level, I think for the most part, listeners probably know when you're working on your opening, it's some combination of uh, engine work and looking at, uh, you know, your fellow grandmasters games in a program like chess base. But how do you work on your end games and tactics, Anna? Uh, Working on the end games, usually I just uh, repeat on uh, reading the books, which I think are really good. Uh, but it's uh, quite important to choose the book that is according to your level, because maybe you know, uh, for me, uh, the, let's say some of, <laughs> some book can be okay, but for the other, they'll say okay, it's too complicated. Yeah, and the same actually for tactics. But for tactics, um, well, uh, for the end games, um, many of the end games are known, and you just have to repeat them. Yeah, the knowledge you get. While for tactics, you always have to look for new material and. Um, 
uh, yeah, the most important thing is to find material that is good uh, um, for your level. So, uh, yeah, we try in different books and then uh, or some puzzles. So nowadays, there are also many web pages which are offering a wide uh, range of uh, different puzzles. So that's also a good option to try. And uh, yeah, it's very important to work um, on it every day because one may think that, okay, I will have the tournament in a few months. Why should I work uh, on my tactical skills now? I will do it two, three days before the tournament and I will be <laughs> great, in a great shape. But it doesn't work like that. I have to tell you that it's really very important to work on your tactical skills uh, regularly because, uh, because you're losing them. Yeah, yeah, you really need daily practice. Um, so, Anna, of course, I think that the caveat you just uh, uh, just stated that listeners, if you say that you read Dvoretsky's Endgame Manual or whatever it may be, that doesn't mean if they order it, they're going to suddenly play like Anna Muzichuk. But um, nonetheless, I do think people might like to hear a few specific things that you worked on, like a few favorite books or um uh, like how you incorporate, like you mentioned, uh, making sure you know end games. Do you practice against engines or do you just read the material again and again? Just a few more details about that, if you don't mind, Anna. Um, as for the end games, uh, I combine um, reading the material I already know because uh, some of the theoretical known end games, you forget some details which are really very important. And especially for such tournaments, before such tournaments as World Cup, when uh, you may get it in one uh, in one of the game and in one of the games, and this will be really crucial. I think it's important to to review these books. I like the Dvoretsky book you mentioned, uh, though there are already a couple of editions, yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> of this book. And uh, I also liked uh, the book written uh, written by Panchenko. I think that Panchenko can be even better for lower rated players because it's a bit easier. I think Voretsky is for higher rated players. Um, As for the tactics, uh, there are plenty of books which I liked. For example, one of my favorite authors um, in a tactical topic, I think, uh, is uh, Ogart. Uh, he has written many books about uh, tact- tactical positions. Uh, also, there are nice books written by Edward in the recent years. Uh, and uh, I also like the book written by Krasenko. So there are there is really a lot of material. And as for the endgame, just sorry, because I started with the books, but then I forgot to mention one more, more thing. Um, you can also improve by checking the games because, for example, you are watching the games of uh, some top level tournaments, doesn't matter, men or women, and sometimes there are some interesting end games arising. And uh, I think it may also be useful if you try to analyze them on your own, or for example, sometimes. Uh, after the games, the players have press conferences and they speak about their thoughts, how they um, thought during the game. And uh, uh, the information given there may uh, help you to improve uh, in uh, your, under- uh, and, uh, uh, your understanding in the end games. Okay. Yeah, a lot of, lot of great insights there. Thank you, Anna. And one more thing on the World Cup before we move on to other topics. I, as, as I mentioned before we started recording, I, you did a like three hour Twitch Q and A, which was awesome. I mean, first of all, the, your generosity with your time and also obviously that kind of access to um, a player of your level, I'm sure your fans really appreciate. Um, and you talked about the fact that uh, at the FIDE World Cup, you're, you're good friends with uh, I am Elizabeth Pates, who you ended up playing and actually winning against. And obviously, I I should have mentioned in the introduction, of course, your sister Maria is also a world-class player and a a former world champion, in fact. Um, And the chess world is small to begin with, but it strikes me that the women's chess world, the, the, the elite women players, it's tiny so how does how does that work like you guys must play each other so much and see each other so much and i'm sure you have personal relationships is it challenging to play these high stakes matches against obviously uh your sister but also your friends and colleagues uh yeah that's true that um 
um, sometimes we have to face each other from tournament to tournament. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, I would say that we are already used to the situation because I am uh, in the top 10 among women. I have been there for more than 12 years already. Uh, so, of course, uh, many of the players I have faced many times. Um, at the same time, there are some younger players, for example, Goryachkina, who is now ranked number two in the world. And with her, I had less games. Uh, but uh, I don't think it's like a very big problem. But of course, it becomes a problem if uh, you have some good relations with someone. With someone. And uh, uh, yes, for me, it was not that pleasant to face uh, Elizabeth. Uh, but uh, we had no choice and uh, sometimes we have round robin tournaments where uh, it's clear that we will play for sure because every opponent plays uh, all the other opponents. Uh, so we have played many games and uh, there have been different, different results. So I think uh, this situation is not new for me. So somehow, yeah, I got used to it. So you just deal with it and there's not much else to do. And what about when you're playing against your sister? I mean, that must be the, the strangest feeling ever. Uh, yeah, it's the strangest and, uh, and uh, in some sense the worst uh, because uh, um, you will never be that satisfied if you win uh, this game or that match. Uh, so that's why... I'm, Many of our games <laughs> were ended peacefully, but of course there were games um, where one of us won. And do you ever hear complaints about you guys drawing when you play? I mean, to me, it's, I mean, the, the whole drawing conversation is, is, you know, I'm not, I'm not opposed to like the 30 move rule and stuff like that. But beyond that, I mean, if there's going to be short draws, I certainly understand in your case. What do you, how do you guys uh, respond to to criticism of any short draws you might have? Um, yeah, sometimes we do get complaints. So on the other hand, many people understand that we are sisters and there is just no better way. Uh, but what I think is strange, um, it's like, you know, people are complaining, but at the same time, it's the most logical result. Let's say if I play not with my sister, but with the player of her level, it's very likely it will still be added in the draw. Yeah. Uh, so it's not like one is giving a point to another person, but uh, we make a draw and the tournament continues. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, Anna, I'd like to look forward a little bit and talk about the 2022 uh, FIDE candidates, but first let's take a quick break and hear from our sponsors. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by ChessMood.com. ChessMood is a subscription video service by a team of GMs headed by Grandmaster Avchek Gregorian, who you can hear on episode 192 of Perpetual Chess. They offer a comprehensive video library featuring an opening repertoire for both colors, as well as courses on middle game and end game mastery. They also have great free content. Avtech has an insightful blog, and they have a YouTube channel featuring daily lessons with a Grandmaster. So all the links you need if you want to find out more are in the show description or just go to chessmood.com and have a look around if you're interested. And we are back. So the 2022 FIDE Women's Candidate, according to my internet research, there's not, all the information has not yet been revealed. Um, from what I can, from what I read, there are seven participants determined. Uh, the aforementioned Alexandra Goryachkina, number two in the world, and uh, young Rising Star, uh, Kanuro Humpy, Katarina Lagno, Alexander Kostinyuk, who of course won the FIDE World Cup, uh, Tan Zhongyi, um, and Anna herself, and I believe two more spots to be determined. And as far as I know, the location and the time to be determined. Anna, have you heard any whispers about when this tournament will uh, take place? No, at the moment I don't have any news about it, and I think none of the players have it. Uh, because, first of all, this year is not ended yet and we still have some tournaments this year. And it's also not that clear in which month they are going to... Uh, FIDE is going to organize um, the candidates tournament next year. I think this will mainly depend when they find the sponsors and when the contract will be signed. Then, of course, the information will be released to, to the public. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, 
Anna, you're super busy, as we've said. I mean, you're busy with your competitive career, let alone all the other uh, opportunities and interests that you have. But I'm, I am curious, how important, like how different is something like the candidates tournament, the chance to play a classical match for the Women's World Championship um, compared to just your your typical tournament? Like, will you start trying to prepare even before you know the venue? Um, or is it just sort of like, you know, you're working on your chess anyway and you have events anyway and you'll worry about it as the details become more clear? Uh I had an experience of playing the candidates tournament the previous time in 2019, and I finished second after Alexandra Gorachkina. So Alexandra Gorachkina played the World Championship match, and uh, I had uh, a successful result, but uh, second place doesn't give you yeah. a chance to, <laughs> to play the World Championship match. Um, so I already could feel how different it is, because only the first place matters. And uh, you have to prepare um, for this tournament in a bit different way than uh, you do for the other events. I can't reveal all the secrets, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yes, it's a bit different. And uh, after you are qualified, it's always in your mind that you will have to play um, candidates tournament. So uh, you are. Um, already thinking about the games of your future opponents as you have said uh, six of them are already uh, clear and uh, two more will be determined uh, one will be determined in october uh, this will be the, there will be the grand swiss tournament and the winner of it will uh, qualify to the candidates and another one will be determined on the 1st of january 2022 by the feeder rating list the highest uh, rated participant uh, will get the place to uh, who is not qualified yeah uh, from those who is not qualified will get the place to the candidates so on the 1st of january we will know all the squad uh, all the participants and i think already there uh, there will be quite um, there will be a more detailed and more deep preparation uh, though of course um, we will have to wait for the announcement of the tournament and then i'm sure it will be done at least a few months before the tournament start uh will start so there will be enough time to to, to prepare and to so once you do have a little more visibility, it, it sounds like you would take some time off to sort of ramp up your preparation. Yeah, come on. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Um, and we had a question from a supporter of the podcast. Uh, Patreon supporters of Perpetual Chest, of course, can uh, find out the guests and submit questions. And we've got a bunch of questions for Anna that we'll start uh, slowly diving into. So uh, question number one is from a um, longtime friend of the pod, Peter Newhall. And we touched on this a bit, but Peter asks, uh, how have you balanced competing and preparing for top woman events with trying to improve your chess level by playing significantly stronger opponents? Um, what do you focus on to improve versus just sort of staying in good form and maintaining your level? Um, I think it depends on the player because uh, here... Um, here people have different approach on how they are going to to improve their play. I think that playing against stronger opponents really makes a lot of sense and this can help a lot. Uh, at the same time, I think you, players have to balance the number of tournaments uh, where they will face stronger opponents and uh, where they will play versus a bit weaker opponents. Because if you play versus the stronger opponents, it's very likely that your result will not be that high. Uh, this is the first point. And also when you're playing against stronger opponents, um, it's psychologically, sometimes you think that, for example, like a draw is already a good result. And uh, then it's uh, then you build your opening repertoire um, uh, according to that, and so on. So it's not only that uh, it has good effects, but it can also have bad effects. So I mm -hmm. think it's good to combine the uh, I mean this number to, to balance this number of tournaments versus strong ground versus weaker opponents. That makes sense. And I I saw you mention on stream you've got the the European club cup coming up uh what else do you have uh what else is on your schedule for the rest of the year anna i uh, quite soon yeah european club cup is starting in about two weeks uh 
and uh, right after the European Club Cup, uh, I'm going to play World Team Championship, uh, where I'll represent Ukrainian national team. And uh, then I am sure there will be also uh, uh, some other tournaments till the end of the year, but I haven't confirmed my participation in them. Okay. Well, look forward to hearing more. And on the topic of you representing the Ukrainian team, um, we have a question from another supporter of the podcast, uh, Jeff Anderson. Thanks for the support, Jeff. And we'll be getting into a few questions from from him. Um, And I know you've talked about this a bit in the past, but... um, Jeff was curious. Um, he he mentioned that you played for the Slovenian team for a long time, and he if you could just uh, briefly go into how that association came about and what brought you back to playing for your native Ukraine. Yes, indeed, this question has been asked many many <laughs> times, and that's a very logical question. It's not a secret that uh, since 2004 to 2014, I represented Slovenia in Chess Federation, so it's ten years. Uh, though I always um, lived in, in Ukraine, I never changed my place of living and uh, the living country. Uh, so the reason behind, uh, um, behind the decision of changing the federation uh, was uh, that um, uh, in 2003, when I was 13, I won uh, a Ukrainian women's championship. Uh, with a uh, quite surprising result, eight and a half points out of nine. And uh, after that, I wasn't taken into the Ukrainian team. Uh, so it was <laughs> uh, very sad for me. Also, later on, there were some promises from the Federation and they were not kept. And after so many things, uh, when my parents uh, realized that uh, the Federation not only doesn't help uh, the young and uh, promising player, uh, the winner of the Women's Ukrainian Champion Championship, but also they are trying somehow to prevent, to stop my chess development. Uh, they took this uh, stance, this decision to change the federation. And uh, back then, the president of the European Chess Union was Slovenian. Uh, his name was Boris Kutin. And uh, after he learned about the situation, about this problem, which I had with the Ukrainian Chess Federation, he offered uh, my parents to represent Slovenia. And uh, that's how I changed the federation. And that's how I played uh, many years under the Slovenian flag. Uh, the reason why I came back was because uh, after many years, of course, uh, um, the president of, of our Ukrainian Federation was changed and uh, the, of course many new people came and they wished me to, to be back. Uh, already at that time my sister was a member of Ukrainian national team and he has played many tournaments for, for Ukraine, many team tournaments. Uh, so it was kind of logical to, to bring me back to, to the native federation and uh, that both sisters represent the same country and the same flag. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm sure all the Ukrainian chess fans are, are glad to have you back. And so I guess we can infer that the conditions have gotten better. I mean, obviously, um, you and your sister are you know, stars in Ukraine, you've been on postage stamps in, in Ukraine. So do, do you feel like now that, that you're getting sufficient support to uh, continue to, um, to uh, work to improve your chess game? Uh, I think that the main motivation is, uh, is your own motivation. And that's what actually drives us to continue and to keep on playing on the very high level. Uh, because to be honest, uh, the players of our level, um, uh, of course, we need quite a strong financial support. And, uh, well, of course, our country and uh, the region where we live, they are trying to support us as much as we can, but uh, as much as they can. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, we also wish that the situation improves uh, at least a little bit. Yeah. Uh, 
so in any case, uh, we are glad to represent Ukraine. Okay. Yeah. Glad to hear it. And for listeners who are kind of maybe newer to how the whole professional chess scene works, I mean, obviously a player like Anna, um, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn here, Anna, but you, you can support yourself professionally as a chess player. You can, you can make a, a good living. But when it comes to trying to be world class at something, you know, if you compare it to a sport like, say, tennis or soccer or whatever it may be, obviously to to compete at an elite level, um, you need people helping you. And that's where it can be challenging because um, those things cost money. And it's one thing to support yourself, but to have a team behind you it requires often um, some external support, at least with the, the current sort of uh, – economic ecosystem of chess. Is that is that a fair uh, summary, Anna, of the situation? Uh, yes, you're quite right. Just many people don't know uh, like which expenses the chess player might have. Yeah, because the board shouldn't be that expensive. The chess set or the chess clock shouldn't be that expensive. Yeah, uh, But in fact, uh, the expenses on the top level are not that small because um, the trainers cost a lot. And uh, we also for, uh, need to pay quite a lot for, um, uh, for computers, for laptops, and we have to improve this uh, technical equipment quite often uh, because uh, uh, with the computers we work every day and the faster the engine is working, the faster you get the information you need. So it's a very important thing to have. And uh, these costs, I have to say, they are quite high. Yeah, and that's why, uh, or one of the reasons why you often see players do end up switching federations. Obviously, uh, Levan Aronian has been in the news for switching to the United States and uh, Ali Reza Farouja, although there were, of course, some political reasons for that as well, but we'll be playing for France. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, chess is doing great, growing. So hopefully it reaches a level where, uh, professionals like yourself, Anna, uh, have the support they need in whichever way it comes, whether it be a corporate sponsorship, government sponsorship, or just you're making so much money that you can just uh, pay people yourself. Uh, any of those would be good by me. But uh, but thank you for, for uh, shedding some light on that. So, and I want to talk a bit about sort of chess improvement and your, your own journey. But first, we're going to take uh, one more break and uh, hear from our sponsors. Perpetual Chess is proud to be brought to you in part by Chessable.com. Chessable, of course, is known for its proprietary move trainer technology, which utilizes space repetition to quiz you and make sure that you remember whatever tactical patterns or opening sequences that you're working on. They have a huge catalog of great books from top flight authors, both for purchase. And if you check for their short and sweet courses, you can find tons of free content. Speaking of free content, Chessable, of course, has also recently launched an adult improvement focused chess podcast called How to Chess with yours truly hosting it. Check for it on Chessable's YouTube channel, and you can also subscribe on the podcast platforms. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by aimchess.com. If you haven't checked out aimchess.com by now, what are you waiting for? What Aim Chess does is it collects your games from the major chess sites and then gives you actionable advice of how to improve your game. It might be to work on a specific opening or to get better at end games or improve your time management or whatever it may be. And then it gives you related puzzles to help you improve that specific skill. They are constantly improving the site. They recently added blindfold tactics, time management training, common checkmate patterns. So there's so much to do there. If you decide to subscribe, be sure to use the promo code PERPETUAL30. Details are in the show notes for aimchess.com. And we are back. So Anna, somewhat famously, uh, you and your sister's parents are both uh, chess trainers in Ukraine. Of course, Ukraine has a, a rich chess tradition. You guys, according to the internet, learn chess at the age of two, which actually I heard you say, so it's not just according to the internet, so which is just absolutely staggering. So um, could you uh, share a little bit about, I mean, I'm curious, of course, about what your parents' teaching method was with you, but also more generally about uh, what contributes to the uh, thriving chess success of uh, so many Ukrainian natives. Um, of course, I have to say that our parents uh, contributed a lot to us becoming good chess players. And uh, 
uh, they were our only coaches until I think uh, we were 11 or something like that. So for quite a long period of time. Uh, my parents are candidate masters. They finished uh, Lviv University of Physical Culture. So they also have the degree of professional coaches. And uh, before I was born, and later on my sister, uh, they were chess players themselves. Uh, themselves. Uh, so they took part in the tournaments. Uh, my mom uh, used to play in some leagues, uh, so they know the chess world, how it, how it uh, looks like and uh, uh, what it is. Uh, after I was born, they decided to focus on training. And uh, they taught me the game and uh, later on my sister. But besides us, uh, they um, also had other students as they worked in the sports school, uh, at the sports school. Uh, they have been working already for more than 30 years and they still continue working at the, at, as the coaches. Uh, so how it was, um, to be honest, I don't remember how it was when I was two. <laughs> Or, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> uh, I remember, I think I started to, to remember some of the episodes when I was uh, four or five, because I remember some uh, some of the days when we were learning some end games and some basics of the pawn end games with opposition and so on. This I remember, actually. I also remember the moments uh, when we uh, went to the park with our parents and uh, there were some tails and uh, we had to jump like chess pieces there. So it was combining physical education oh, with wow. chess, uh, chess learning. Uh, this I also remember that was funny. From the words of my parents, from what my parents told me, uh, they, uh, they uh, tried to invent a new system because uh, they didn't have any practice of uh, teaching someone who is two years old, obviously. <laughs> and um, they thought about uh, how they would do that and uh, so on. Uh, so what they told me, they tried to have regular lessons, but not that long. Uh, not for a very long period because the child um, can't keep the concentration for a very long time. So, for example, it could be just five minutes, uh, then I go to play some other games, and then I come back uh, and they explain some other things, then I do some other things. So it was with some breaks, um, but uh, uh, this way the child is not bored. And uh, the child is not forced to do something what uh, the child doesn't want. So I think it's actually a good method to, to you know, first of all, show it in a kind of uh, game in the way that is interesting for the child and uh, this period periodical method. method. Makes sense. Yeah, I know that mini games, like uh, I think I, I saw you mention on stream, like a pawn game um, and stuff like that. That's taken um, increased prominence in recent years for educators of uh, new chess players. But I am curious, Anna, obviously you and your sister amassed like tons of world youth championships. So you guys got very strong very quickly. So as that continued, was it uh, like how much of it, what you were learning was due to lessons and game analysis with your parents, how much of it maybe was just playing a lot and sort of a natural talent and how much of it was your parents just straight up giving you puzzles to do? Um, it's never actually possible to measure yeah, <laughs> the yeah. percentage of, uh, of each thing, which, uh, um, which uh, when you make a summary, yeah, uh, which uh, yeah. is the result. Uh, but I think that um, in the very beginning, it's very important uh, to play more games because that's how you learn. Uh, that's how you develop the feeling and uh, the feeling of different patterns, uh, the feeling of time. Uh, that's uh, how you learn on your own mistakes. And I remember that when I was uh, a kid, I played in many tournaments uh, because it's very easy to analyze the games. <laughs> mm -hmm. That period, yeah, usually it's just uh, some huge blunder from one of the right. sides. 
<laughs> and uh, yeah, let, let's say comparing to to nowadays, you can analyze one game for days because I mean, not four days, not four, but four days. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, so yeah, I remember that playing the tournaments and uh, solving many puzzles was um, the main, the key points to which uh, my parents paid uh, a lot of attention. And were you, did you sometimes feel like um, you weren't in the mood for chess and did it anyway? Or were you just sort of lapping it up and enjoying every moment of playing and exor- puzzle solving uh, from the beginning, Anna? I have to say that I like chess from the very beginning. Uh, what I like the most about chess was that um, I was quite successful already as a kid. Yeah, I started winning uh, European Youth Championships when I was six, and then I won this title five more times, and also the Amazing. World Youth yeah. Championships. Uh, so, of course, for the child, it's, it's important to be successful, to get the cup, to get the medal, diploma, and it uh, gives you a great feeling. And what I also liked... Uh, that uh, it gave me the opportunity to travel. I really liked traveling to different countries and uh, visiting different places. At the same time, I can't say that every single moment, every single minute, I really enjoyed uh, the training process. Uh, Because, of course, you're a kid and uh, you realize that instead of, uh, you know, going just to walk, to play, to have fun with the other kids, uh, you are sitting in front of some difficult puzzle and you have no idea how to solve it. And uh, yeah, your parents are like, no, but you have to find it and so on. Um, so I don't know how it was. Um, I think that it was uh, some combination. Yeah, like when you are successful, it gives you motivation to work more and more. Makes sense. Um, okay. And we've got a, a chess improvement related question from new supporter of the podcast, Igor Feinstein. So thanks for the support, Igor. And just to give a bit of context, Igor says uh, he's an exclusively online chess player rated around 1600 in Blitz. But recently, he's started to focus more on studying with books and using the tactical trainer on chess.com. He enjoys going over master games from game collection books. But the question that, that Igor has is... Uh, to get the most out of the games, what, in your opinion, is the best Im- approach? How often should he try to guess? Should he try to guess the moves for both sides? Um, should he use the games for opening exploration um, or use opening resources for that? How much time, on average, to spend on a game? Uh, just some some guidelines. And I, these are good questions because I think a lot of uh, adult chess players aren't sure how to approach game analysis, Anna. Uh, yes, true. And uh, this is the question I also receive uh, very often because many people say like, okay, I do this or I do that and somehow I can't improve. So what should I do? Uh, and it's a bit difficult to say because um, there is no general rule. Yeah, If there was some rule, everybody would just follow it and be successful. So uh, for every chess player, it should be individual. Uh, but what I think can work for everyone is, and uh, one of the most important things in my opinion is, uh, you will really improve if you check your own games more carefully. Because when you check your own games, you realize which mistakes you make more often, on which status, and uh, these are the points where you have to improve. And for every person, it will be different. Every, uh, obviously. Uh, So that's what I am really recommending. Check your own games really carefully. Not only like, oh, here I made a blunder and uh, I don't care about the rest of the game because if I didn't make that blunder, then it would have gone differently. No, don't Mm -hmm. do it like that, but also check the opening. Even if you think, um, uh, not only the opening, I mean every stage, but uh, I just want to give you an example because you may think like the opening was great, you didn't have any problems, but maybe it's because uh, you made some mistake on the opening and your opponent didn't realize that and he missed the chance to pose serious problems. And the same about the middle games, the same about the end games, the same about strategical points. Uh, so the first thing is uh, to check the games, 
And uh, the second thing uh, which I will um, suggest you to work on is the tactical skills because uh, it's important on every level and it's even much, 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 much more important on the lower uh, level. As I have mentioned, many games are decided just by a huge blunder. So if your tactical skills are great, uh, even if they are already very good, you think for your level, still keep on working uh, on tactics. Great advice. Now, Anna, I know you had a sort of classical upbringing playing tournaments from a very young age, but someone like Igor only playing on online, does that change the advice at all? Or do you think that he, I mean, obviously this isn't like your set of experiences, but do you have a sense whether um, whether one could could extrapolate as many lessons from their games if they're only playing online? The main point here is with which control they are playing the games, because uh, if you are playing bullet, I don't, by the way, I don't <laughs> recommend anyone to play bullet because you will learn nothing out of that. Well, you will improve your mouse skills for sure, but uh, you will not learn much. Okay, maybe some tactical skills, but uh, mainly the bullet, uh, especially on the lower levels, it's just, you know, making a random move. And you can't draw any conclusions out, out of that because uh, it's very no normal to blunder something in bullet. And... Uh, you didn't think about anything, you just made the move by intuition. So, okay, like uh, if you analyze the game after that, which conclusions will you draw? I think you can't learn much. Uh, so even for the Blitz games, uh, it's not that easy because still there is not that much time. But if you play in the internet and if you play with uh, at least rapid time control or even better some classical games, uh, it's of course not the same as the tournament game, but uh, the situation is very close to, to reality. So I think uh, the important thing is to play with um, a longer time control. Okay. And last thing on Igor's question, I mean, he did mention reading classical chess books. I think a lot of people hear it recommended on uh, podcasts like this one and on, on chess streams. Um, was that a big part of your chess upbringing, Anna? From what you said, it sounds like it was more an emphasis on puzzles in your own games. Uh, you know, when I was young, when I was a kid, I was raised in a completely different time. Uh, for example, I got my first computer when I was 11. And now every kid who is like three years old already yeah. have an, a computer, a laptop, and uh, an iPhone, an iPad, right. and so on and so on. Um, and on one hand, it's good because, of course, um, um, children, they became more accelerated. Yeah, they learn faster. And on the same time, at the same time, they... Mm, started to think less with their own head. Uh, so I remember that when I was young, um, I used to analyze my games uh, mm, on my own or with my uh, uh, parents or with my coaches. But nowadays people can just, you know, press one button and the engine tells you <laughs> the story <laughs> of your yeah. life. Yeah, like immediately where you made a mistake. So um, I think here also should be some balance. Uh, and uh, one, uh, one more advice I can give you is that uh, when you're analyzing your own games, don't immediately start analyzing it with the computer. First, check it on your own and think with your own head like what was wrong and what was right. And only after you have spent some time um, with uh, checking on your own, only then press this engine button. And I think this way uh, many people can improve faster. Okay, um, uh, excellent advice, Anna. And we've got another chess improvement question and then we'll move on to other, other topics. So this one is uh, for, again from Jeff Anderson and he says con congrats on uh, all of your success. Um, and he mentioned several perpetual chess guests over the years have remarked that the ability to calculate game variations accurately and quickly is what separates the average chess player from a top level talent such as yourself. Do you agree with that? And do you do anything to improve and or keep sharp your natural calculating ability? Uh, we have um, spoken yeah, about this topic for, <laughs> for quite a few times. 
but I don't think that uh, this is the thing which, uh, like, not the length of the lines we are able to calculate, but the precision of the lines. Because sometimes we calculate only two, three moves ahead, but still these two, three moves will be much more precise than, let's say, a player of 2000 level, yeah? Uh, just an example. Uh, so, um, yeah, people should work uh, uh, regular and constantly on the tactical skills and uh, uh, with the solving different positions, different, different puzzles, different studies, uh, you will def definitely improve your tactical skills. Yeah. Okay. Excellent advice. Yeah. And I know that there's been some overlap in the questions, but I actually think that that's a really good insight that you just provided. So Anna, let's move to a different topic. Um, we have another listener question, which of course is related to Queen's Gambit. We can't interview a, a woman chess player without <laughs> the inevitable Queen's Gambit question uh, coming up. So shout out to Rob Steele who asks, uh, what did you think of the series uh, Queen's Gambit? And um how did you think it influenced the chess world? And um, if there are any similarities in your life to Beth Harmon's? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, well, I have, I will start uh, with, uh, um, with saying that, uh, yes, I have what a series. And uh, as uh, I am a professional chess player, I, I can't... Uh, not be amazed by uh, the result and uh, uh, the admiration of so many people uh, who watch this series. Yeah, the, the numbers are just amazing. And uh, some people who have never played chess, who have never maybe, okay, not heard about the game, but who didn't know much about the game, like they were not sure if it's a board game, is it a card game, or what is it in general, uh, they started to be interested in chess. And all this boom that uh, was created during the pandemics, of course, uh, it affected chess in general in a very good way because more people started to play chess, more people started to be interested in chess, more parents thought about uh, teaching their kids to play chess or uh, about uh, uh, their kids joining some chess clubs. And uh, of course, it's great because I think that um, chess is a really interesting and nice game. And even if uh, the child won't become a grandmaster, won't become a professional chess player, I think that by learning the game, uh, uh, this kid or children, <laughs> if we talk in a massive, yeah, uh, will actually get some important skills and will learn a lot what will help them uh, later on on their uh, in their daily life yeah so i don't think it's a coincidence when we think about the fact uh, that many famous people in different fields they know how to play chess uh, moreover more of them uh, not only know how to move the pieces but they can uh, come up with some interesting ideas uh, so i really recommend like um, parents uh, who have children so that they at least uh, uh, show them the game and the, the, like the main rules and, uh, uh, and uh, the ideas. Um, what, what were the other questions? <laughs> Um, <laughs> let me uh, pull it back up. Um, I, I, I remember that if there is something similar to... To me, yeah. Between Beth yeah, Beth. similarities in your in your life and uh, chess developments to Beth's, which I hope there aren't too many similarities because <laughs> Beth uh, Beth had some issues um, that she was trying to work through. Uh, yeah, on the other hand, uh, uh, the way of uh, the life of the main uh, actor, uh, the main actress, Beth Harmon, has uh, actually nothing to do with the life of professional chess players um, because uh, we live a completely different life and uh, it's also uh, it's not only about not taking the drugs not taking alcohol uh, and all the other things and uh, issues yeah uh, but it's also very difficult to, you know to uh, to be successful in um, 
in the atmosphere she was raised, uh, especially nowadays. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, the chess part, which was shown um, in in the movies, uh, is quite close to to the tournaments uh, we had at the, at the times which were shown in this movie. Uh, like all these tournaments, how the players are moving, yeah, how they are sitting. Uh, so, and the games, the games, yeah. of course. <laughs> and Gary Kasparov made a great uh, work together with the producers. Uh, uh, so, of course, uh, because many chess players, when we are watching some some movies, where um, we see chess games, uh, we immediately pay attention to what is happening on the board. Yeah, of course. And, yeah. <laughs> and very often uh, people, uh, they just, uh, they just uh, you know, skip these moments and they just put the pieces randomly. And, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> and we realize, oh no, <laughs> how, how, yeah. how could it be? Why they didn't do that? Why they didn't ask? I mean, they have a small episode where chess is shown. And for this, you could ask uh, any you know, player of 2000, being rated 2000, and uh, he will immediately tell you like how it should be and how it should look normally. Uh, so... At this series, of course, all the chess games, they were really very well filmed and uh, the games were, which were played in this series were uh, the real games. Uh, so that was interesting to watch. Yeah, I've mentioned this before, but uh, Kasparov did a talk for uh, Jen Shahadi's uh, girls club here in the U.S. And he talked about the many hours he spent selecting each game. So it was not uh, not by accident that it was able to uh, pass your test, Anna. Um, and one more. And first of all, I also want to say shout out to all the uh, all the Queen's Gambit fans listening. I know it did bring in a new generation of chess fans. And obviously what Anna says about chess being useful for kids in terms of learning critical thinking skills is important. But I also think uh, the brutally unforgiving nature of chess is a useful skill for adults to uh, to um, grapple with all the mistakes we make and, you know, try to make slightly fewer uh, each day um, is a constant struggle for chess players. And obviously, um, if it's properly balanced in your life, it's a good skill for any adult. So welcome to, to anyone listening. Now, Anna, I know um, a lot of... Uh, the woman chess players that I'm friendly with, uh, they had a lot more media exposure in the wake of uh, Queen's Gambit, maybe some more professional opportunities. Um, uh, it did, was that the case in Ukraine as well? Was that Has that been the case for you? Uh, many people started talking about the movie and I was asked uh, to give many interviews. So obviously with these people uh, remember it more about... Uh, the chess and uh, about the success of uh, Ukrainian chess players. So, of course, it did have uh, some effect. I will also add that you are right, the chess is good not only for the kids, but also for the adults and even for grown-ups. Because for adults, uh, I think it's a good distraction, like after the work, you, uh, you get into the game of chess and you can... Um, gain completely new skills and I think it's uh, competitive, it's interesting. While for grown-ups it keeps their mind fresh, so it's also very important. And there is another important fact uh, that uh, those of grown-ups uh, who, let's say, are retired, yeah, uh, they never have uh, Alzheimer's diseases. It's already proven, so if you keep on playing chess, you will be healthy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Anna, we have one more listener question, which of course has to do with uh, the the controversy. Uh, well, I don't know if it, I guess you could call it a controversy, but your decision in 2017 not to play in uh, the FIDE tournament in Saudi Arabia, of course, this led to you doing a TED talk and, uh, you know, the Facebook post that you wrote about it went viral. So I um, just to give listeners, <clears throat> excuse me, the aforementioned newer chess fans um, a bit more context about uh, this event. Anna, if it's okay with you, I'll read your uh, your viral pa- Facebook statement. Uh, sorry, could you please repeat the question? 
Oh, sure. Um, do you mind if I read the statement that you issued when you decided not to uh, play in, um, oh, okay, okay. in Saudi Arabia? So Anna at the time wrote, and again, this has been shared many times, um, in a few days, I'm going to lose two world champion titles one by one just because I decided not to go to Saudi Arabia, not to play by someone else's rules, not to wear a baya, not to be um, accompanied getting outside, and altogether not to feel myself a secondary creature. Um, exactly one year ago, I won these two titles and was about the happiest person in the chess world, but this time I feel really bad. I'm ready to stand for my principles and skip the event, event where in five days I was expected to earn more than I do in a dozen events combined. All that is annoying, but the most upsetting thing is that nobody really cares. That's a really bitter feeling. Still not the one to change my opinion and my principles. The same goes for my sister Maria, and I'm really happy that we share this point of view. Um, and yes, for those few who care, we'll be back. And you you have you are back, of course. And uh, as you mentioned, the the prize for that tournament. Uh, that you decided not to play in in Saudi Arabia was eight times higher. Um, so I just wanted to read that to give the context for Jeff Anderson's last question, which is um, you and your sister boycotted that tournament after your protest. Has FIDE decided to stop spend sponsoring elite women's chess tournaments in Saudi Arabia, to your knowledge, Anna? Oh, yeah, it was... <laughs> Um, it was a very difficult decision for us, uh, and uh, this was not just a regular tournament, it was the World Championships, and I was the reigning champion in uh, these two categories in Rapid and Blitz back then. And in the beginning, I did write that uh, kind of nobody cared, because it's the first time something like that happened, uh, but actually after my post, many people cared. Uh, like the post uh, which I wrote was uh, liked and shared more than 250, uh, two, uh, 250,000 times. So it's a lot. And you may imagine that if other people shared the, the post of the other people which, who shared my right. post. Uh, so it actually influenced uh, the minds of millions, I would say. And, uh, you know, uh, I still keep on receiving messages from people uh, who, uh, who read this post even recently, uh, maybe it just appeared in some, of, uh, in some posts of other people. So I still keep on receiving messages. That's a bit surprising because more than uh, three years passed since, uh, since I wrote that post and since I took this uh, decision to skip the World Championships in Saudi Arabia, of course, together with my sister. Uh, but uh, yeah, people do care. <laughs> So I am really thankful for all the support we have got. And uh, we already had uh, uh, positive uh, results out of it. Because first of all, uh, women's uh, elite tournaments were not stopped to be sponsored. And uh, the second thing is that... Uh, FIDE had a contract with the Saudi Arabia for three years, but already uh, the next uh, year, the tour, the World uh, Rapid and Blitz Championships were not organized in Saudi Arabia, so it did have an influence. That's great. Well, for, <clears throat> first of all, obviously not the first to say this, but it's great that you stood up for your principles and obviously also glad that FIDE responded uh, in kind um, and you know, hopefully uh, we can... Um, continue to have better and better conditions and, uh, you know, um, host tournaments in, in ways that treat everyone, treat women, obviously as, as equals. Um, so, um, just thank you again for doing that. Thank you, John. Um, so Anna, uh, just one or two more topics. Um, number one, as we record, um, you just a few days ago wrote an article about chess space. You and your sister hosted a tournament in Ukraine. Um, so could you could you tell us a little bit about um, what went into that and how you felt that it went? And, and again, you wrote about it, but it would be fun to hear your firsthand perspective. Uh, yes, we did hold a, we did hold a tournament uh, for children. Uh, it was held in uh, Lviv region, uh, not far from the place where I live now. And uh, we are very glad that finally... Um, 
we managed to do so uh, because we were planning to hold this tournament um, two years ago. Uh, but the pandemic started and uh, we had nothing to do but just uh, the only <laughs> there was only one decision and the only one way to do it we had to postpone the tournament and finally we did it uh we are uh, glad to uh we are uh, thankful to everyone who helped us to organize this event and uh, there were really many people standing behind it like our parents uh, the organizers the local authorities arbiters and uh, uh, i think we did it in a very nice way because the place where the tournament was played was really very nice um, landscape. Uh, we played on the territory of the castle. Uh, there is also a very nice lake and uh, it's a new, uh, kind of a new, uh, not the territory, but many new things were built there, like uh, new buildings, like restaurants, hotels. So it was very nice. And also we are glad that we had uh, quite many participants. Uh, we had uh, 148 participants in total. And the tournament was open for kids who were born in 2004 or later. Uh, so it's a, it was quite a big and um, successful in my event, in my opinion. Also, there after the tournament, we have got uh, many nice feedbacks from participants, from parents, from coaches, and uh, they wrote us that uh, they liked how the tournament was held, and uh, that they are thankful to us for organizing this event, uh, and they wish that next year we have another tournament. Yeah, this will already be. Hopefully, this will already be the second Mozartuk Sisters Cup. Excellent. I don't know how you do it, Anna. I don't know how you find time for so much stuff and still, you know, able to compete at an elite level. Um, and of course, that gets to your Twitch streaming. I mean, again, I was just checking it out last night. Now, obviously, you've got some very loyal fans. But as you were saying, you you can't stream as much as like the full time chess streamers. So how do you how do you balance something like that? You're clearly very enthusiastic and you, you do a great job and you've got a lot of uh, chess knowledge and stories to share, but you can't be out there 30, 40 hours a week as a lot of the, uh, the Twitch streamers are. Uh, yes, it's true. I can't, uh, I don't consider myself as a streamer and I don't call myself as a streamer, <laughs> though I started streaming um, when the pandemic started. So I think I opened my Twitch channel in April 2020. And uh, in the beginning, of course, I had more streams because there were no tournaments um, and I had more time uh, for doing that. Uh, well, in the last months, I have had uh, many events and uh, well, obviously during the events you can't stream, it just uh, it takes a lot of uh, time and energy and you have to be fully focused on, on the tournament. Uh, so some time ago, uh, like after coming from the World Cup and after quite a long break, because before the World Cup, I also had uh, training camps and uh, I played the Grand Prix tournament, which I already mentioned, and I had preparation for the Grand Prix tournament. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I think I had a very long break. This break was something like three months. But I was glad to be back. Uh, streaming is one of my hobbies. And uh, I am thankful uh, to my so-called Team Solid community. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, and there are quite many people who are very loyal, who understand that uh, I am a professional chess player and I stream whenever I can, but when I can't, I just can't. Uh, there are many people who have been subscribed to my channel from the very beginning, like uh, they are all the subscribers for 15 months or 16 months. <laughs> Uh, so thanks to all of you and uh, yes, I think I will continue streaming. Now I do it uh, less frequently than how it was before, but, uh, but I will keep on doing it. Uh, 
and uh, as long as people keep on supporting me as long as people keep on uh, being interested in uh, different things uh, which are happening in my life uh, i'm ready to um, to share my thoughts with them and uh, help them improve in chess as well <laughs> that's great to hear and of um and do you think, Anna, that it might take an increased role, like as the, the years go on? Is this something you'd like to ramp up eventually if you're like, uh, you know, if you ever dial back the, the competitive um, aspect of your career? Uh, it's difficult to say because I have no idea how long my uh, professional career will last and how long I'll keep on playing on this top level. Uh, but this is one of the things so which uh, which is interesting for me. Uh, it's also um, questionable like how my streaming will be popular yeah because during the pandemic the popularity of uh, streaming of chess streaming of uh, um, like um, yeah the number of people who started streaming increased a lot and the number of people who were interested in chess streaming increased a lot but we have no idea how it will be let's say in five years yeah if it's it will still be popular or not. Uh, so we have got a lot of uh, popular and successful chess streamers, and this is great. And I think uh, it's additional. Uh, uh, it was additional contribution of uh, Queen's Gambit. Yeah. So, um, uh, but uh, yeah, in a few years so we can talk, and uh, we will see <laughs> if I will spend more hours on streaming or not, or what will I do. Uh, let's say the first time I started commentating was also during the pandemic and I like it a lot. So I am uh, also very happy when I have an opportunity to commentate on some chess events and some chess games. Uh, by the way, soon, <laughs> like very, very soon, already this Thursday, I don't know, I oh, know the interview will be released. <laughs> yeah, but but you can mention it and we'll check. What, what event were you going to mention? I, I will commentate <laughs> on the online chess Olympiad. Ah, excellent. Yeah. And, and hopefully, again, we're recording uh, two weeks before this will be uh, released, but um, I'm sure that there'll be more commentating. And you're also involved with the Challengers Chess Cup as a trainer of uh, some elite talents. What's the uh, what's the timeline with that one, Anna? Uh, yeah, this is a very interesting project organized by Chess24 Platform. I am uh, one of the coaches uh, uh, of this project, and I have uh, four uh, very nice and very promising young chess players, to girls, to boys. Uh, and I am also very glad that... Uh, I got this opportunity because training was another thing, another yeah. new thing for me. I, I have tried so many new things during the pandemic. Uh, I was, you know, it was a bit shaky in the very beginning because when I got the offer and they said, well, you will have very strong students, uh, like all of them rated over 2400, I was like, Oh my God, what am I going to do with them? <laughs> they are not that very far from my level. And, uh, um, you know, coaching and uh, playing, they are different things. Yeah, you have to have material. Uh, and uh, being a good chess player doesn't mean that you're a good coach, <laughs> right? Uh, but, you know, after thinking uh, for some time, I decided to try. I mean, uh, I thought like, okay, why not? Let's try and let's see if uh, this uh, direction is uh, interesting for me and how will I do. And, you know, after already the first few sessions, I realized that it's actually very interesting. Uh, because when you're working with uh, really strong players, uh, and you're trying to find material uh, for this level, uh, you already improve your own skills. Uh, so it's not like, it's a bit different when you have to train the beginners, because when you're working with the beginners, usually your level drops down uh, as, uh, uh, as the practice shows. <laughs> Uh, but when you're working with someone uh, who is quite strong, it's uh, very interesting and uh, I have nice students, so it's also quite enjoyable. That's great. 
Um, and Anna, uh, I think this is my very last question. Um, what what else aside from chess? What else are you interested in? Do you have any like totally unrelated uh, hobbies, or you, it sounds like you're so busy that it <laughs> might be challenging? I don't know if I may call these hobbies, but I like doing sports, uh, so I go to the gym quite regularly. I also like uh, drawing from time to time. I think you can find some of my Instagram posts where, uh, uh, on which I am featured with some of my <laughs> great paintings. All right, I'll have to <laughs> dig deeper. I miss those. <laughs> yeah, just kidding. But uh, that's what I really like to do when I have some spare time. Uh, sometimes I like uh, cooking. Uh, so yeah, different things. Um, but. Um, um, obviously, yeah, I have I am involved in many projects and uh, in uh, first of all uh, my chess career and everything that is related to that takes a lot of time. Uh, so uh, I don't have so much free time, but it's always nice to to do also some other things or just even you know some casual things like spending time with friends, uh, what uh, I appreciate a lot because I don't have an opportunity to, to see people who are very important for me uh, that often as, I, as, as I'm traveling very often. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, well, Anna, we'll be rooting for you uh, in every tournament, but especially in the candidates tournament. Um, You've got your Twitch stream um, in terms of people um, uh, rooting you on and keeping up with you, Anna. Is your Instagram page the best way? What's the, what's the best way for people to uh, track your continued success? <laughs> I don't know what's the best, but uh, people may find me on Instagram, on Facebook, on uh, s- streams of uh, Twitch or YouTube. Okay. Excellent. And uh, yeah, and the, and uh, on Chess24 and the list commentating and the list goes on. So Anna, thank you so much. This has been a real honor for me and uh, really appreciate your being so generous with your time and your insights. Uh, ben, thanks to you too for this interview. The questions have been really, very interesting. And uh, thanks to the viewers who sent uh, their own questions. I hope uh, you learned something out of the answers and uh, Play chess, enjoy chess, and uh, good luck in everything you all do in uh, your daily life. Okay, excellent. And listeners, be sure to support Anna's Twitch efforts. We don't want her to. Uh, <laughs> we don't want her to um, have it fall by the wayside. Even though we would, we would understand if that happens for for someone uh, playing these other uh, incredible chess players all the time. Uh, so thanks again, Anna. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who listens to and supports the podcast. And most of all, thank you to my producer, Matthew Passy. Be sure to check us out on social media. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Beneficial1. We also have a Perpetual Chess Facebook group where we continue the conversation about each episode. I've even got the Instagram page locked and loaded, actually posting clips every week. So you can follow at Perpetual Chess to catch some clips there. Um, I also want to thank our sponsors, of course, uh, Chessable.com, the original sponsor of Perpetual Chess, Aim Chess, Chess Mood. Thanks. I'm proud to be affiliated with all of these sites. Um, Also want to thank Blue Wire Podcast, with whom I partner. Big shout out to Blue Wire. Check them out for sports podcasts. But most of all, I want to thank the individuals who helped make Perpetual Chess go via PayPal or Patreon. And of course, they get to find out the guests, send in questions here Uh, occasional GM lectures on Zoom, um, and even get ad-free podcasts. So thank you all for supporting Perpetual Chess and keeping it going. So without further ado, I would like to give special thanks to the following people and entities. Chessable.com, David Lazarus of LazmanChess.com, Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, the Abysmal Depths of Chess blog. Shout out to JB. Adapta Interactive Web Designs and Services, The Apprentice Twitch Channel, Aniti Deer, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porteau, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, The Charlotte Chess Center, The Chess Central's Chess Blog, ChessMood.com, Chris Flanagan, Chris Lott, Dan O'Hanlon, 
Daniel He, Danny Davidson, David Mitchell, I am Dimitri Schneider, Douglas Wilson, I am Eric Rosen, Farhan Thawar, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Glenn Downing, Greg Harfst, Greg Shahadi, Gregory Gullick, Hampus Axelson, James Kennedy, Jay Garrison, Jeff Martinson, Jeff Schaefer, Jeremy Nilsson, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John MacArthur, Kevin Forsyth, Kevin Gilmore, Kevin O'Callaghan, Kevin Pryor, King Selt, King's Crusher YouTube channel, the law offices of Stuart Katz, Matthew Feeney, Michael Can, FM Michael Oblin, Mr. Mike Shahadi, the famous Mr. Dodgy, the Nerd Nace Twitch channel, Peter McManus, GM Peter Prohaska, Peter Soddy, Philip Lummins, the Playmore Chess Academy of the Hamden Chess Club, Ray Lillywhite, Reuven Fisher, Robert Hansen, Ross Crossland, Seattle Chess Club, Shane Unger, Stefan Kelty, Stephen Martinez, Sven Gearson, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant of StrongChess.com, Todd Kennedy, the Vintage Patsers, which is a Chess.com improver group, and Wayne Bean. I would also like to give thanks to Ace Viega, Adam Fowler, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Al Hastings, Alan and Maggie Sue, Alex Pejas, Alexander Markovitz, Antonio Cancino, Antonio Leonfort, FM Andre Tarakov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Angus McLeod, Barry Hessian, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Bill Trammell, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brandon Halseed, Brian Chase, Brian Mullis, Bruce Scott, Brian Tillis of Palm Beach Chess, Cameron Davis, Ken Kabadai, sorry, Ken, Ken Kabadai, Chad Hilton, Chad Likens of Rose City Chess in Portland, Oregon, Chess for Charity in Jacksonville, Chess Patser, Spain, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Kiefer, Chris Wainscott, Chris, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, AKA Chess Explained, Coach J's Chess Academy, Costa Caros, Courtney Fry, Craig Mallon, Daniel Ginsburg, Daniel Naylor, Dave Best, Dave Saylor, David Blaskotschek, David Brown, David Gores, David Hamblin, David Cramley, David Peterson, Dennis Parrish, FM, Donnie Ariel, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Ed Mead, Edwin Rodriguez, Ethan Smith, Evan Rosenberg, Ewan Richardson, Ian Mason, Felipe Melo Perilla, Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Letarte Lavoie, uh, Frank Tortoris, MD, Frank Zananis, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Gautam Narula, uh, Gene Stewart, George Foote, George Harris, Giovanni Russo, Gregory Higgins, Han Shute, Harish Srinivasan, Howard V. Han. Uh, Jacob Kovac, Jason Apollo, Jason Murray, Jacques Perry, James Aspinwall, James Benastia, James Muir, Jason Willem, Jay Tuttle, J. Deep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Hoyland, Jerry Wells, Jesse Damas, Dekumus, excuse me, Jesse, Jesse McNulty, Jim Ratliff, Jim Sadler, Joe Desano, Joe Valdez, Joe Th- Thomas Ramos, John McAdams, John Tully, Juan Almagor, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jonathan Bannister, Jonathan Slater, John Quist, John Tully, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, Justin Goodfeller, Jen Shahadi, Joe Rocky, John Thompson, Grandmaster Josh Fredell, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovutsky of Chess Dojo, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Cook, Larry Ryforth, Macaulay Peterson, Maria ML. Emil Yanova, AKA Photo Chess, Mark Chaves, Mark Fitzpatrick, Mark Miller, Mark Wilkins, Marco Bulatovich, Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matt Ferrari, Matthew Allen Coughlin, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, Matthias Plock, the Mechanics Institute of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Michael Hudson, Mike Clem, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Gobel, Nate Solon, Neil Bruce, Negma Milijanov, Nicholas Isabel, Olaf Mueller Michaels, Pablo Davida, Grandmaster Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Eckert, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Queenside Management uh, Limited of Switzerland, Randall Montgomery, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Richard Hollenbach, Richard Tucker, Robert Callahan, Robert Turner, Robert Wall, Robert Wilson, Rory Coleman, Ryan Berg, Sampson Teaches Chess, Satyajit Malugu, The Say Chess Publishing, Unstoppable Empire, Scott McKinnon, Scott Rose, Sean Krause, Sebastian Finsterwalder, Sergey McCagan, Seth Ruzica, Seth Will, Sean Tracy, Silver Knights in Richmond, Simon Schmidt, Stefan Roller, Stephen Miller, and Tom George, uh, WGM Tatyav Abrahamian, Terry King, Thomas Brown, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, 
FM Timothy Wall, Tobiah, Rex, Tom Edzo, Tommy Farron, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Victor Beauchamp, William Brock, William Peterson, FM Zhao Cheng of Chess1000.com, and last but never least, Zhivko, Zhivko Stoyanov. So thanks for listening, everyone. We will catch you all next week. Thank you.